with this 13900K, we got it all the way up to 6.5 gigahertz. I would have never imagined seeing 6.5 gigahertz on what is essentially still water cool. unregulated mode. However, the tech always runs at full power. Thus, the temperature will drop well below ambient. Cache Dynamic OC Switcher is similar in that it enables switching at a specific trigger point. Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I am overclocking the Intel Core i9-13900K P cores all the way up to 6.5 GHz using the Maximus Z790 Apex motherboard and the EK Quantum Delta 2 Tech. This is going to be a slightly different type of content that you would normally see from Scatterbencher videos. Because I already overclocked the 13900K in Scatterbencher number 49, in this video, I want to focus specifically on overclocking the P cores. Also, I want to leverage the Intel cryo cooling technology to get more performance and higher frequencies. In addition to that, I will assume that you already know the basics of Intel CPU overclocking. So I will skip all the basic steps and go straight to explaining how to, or how I went about tuning this specific system. Either way, I hope you still enjoy the video. The Intel Core i9-13900K is part of Intel's 13th generation core processor lineup. Intel Raptor Lake builds on top of the performance hybrid architecture introduced with the 12th generation Alder Lake. While it may sound like Raptor Lake is not much different from its predecessor, the spec sheet reads quite impressive. The Raptor Cove P cores in the Raptor Lake CPUs are an evolution of the Golden Cove P cores in Alder Lake. The improvements mainly consist of higher frequencies, increased L2 cache, and a new dynamic prefetch algorithm. Compared to its Core i9-12900K predecessor, launched one year ago, the 13900K has a 600 MHz higher maximum turbo boost frequency and 8 additional threads while costing $60 less. In this video, we will be covering 5 different overclocking strategies. First, we unleash the Turbo Boost 2.0 limits and enable XMP 3.0. Second, we overclock using ASUS AI overclocking technology and XMP tweaked. Third, we get into the manual tuning of Raptor Lake P cores. Fourth, we fine tune our manual overclock using Intel's OZTVB technology. Lastly, we'll explore the limits of the P cores using the cryo cooling unregulated mode. However, before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. By connecting the EFC to the EVC2 device, I monitor the ambient temperature, water temperature, and fan duty cycle. I also use the Elmo Labs EFC to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. Without going into too many details, I've attached an external temperature sensor from the water in the loop to the EFC. Then I use the low high setting to map the fan curve from 25 to 40 degrees water temperature. I use this configuration for all overclocking strategies. The main takeaway from this configuration is that it gives us a good indicator of whether the cooling solution is saturated. The EK Quantum Delta 2 Tech is EK's fourth generation tech water block. It incorporates the improved Peltier element from the Delta Tech Evo and the improved controller electronics from the Delta Tech Evo E2. Additionally, it's moved from EK's special edition Quantum X portfolio to the more mainstream premium Quantum Line portfolio. The improved 200 watt Peltier element extends the maximum CPU package power capability to 260 watt with the Core i9-13900K. That's quite impressive. The Delta Tech series emerged when Intel introduced the cryocooling technology in 2020. Intel cryocooling technology is an intelligent sub-ambient cooling product that offers a new and improved overclocking experience on desktop. Intel's cryocooling technology is built around the thermoelectric effect or Peltier effect. Essentially, the Peltier effect is the translation of differences in temperature into an electrical voltage or vice versa. The main benefits of using Peltier cooling, for overclockers that is, is that you can reach sub-ambient temperatures, and that usually translates into higher overclocking potential. However, there are also some disadvantages. 
First, condensation. A Pelche cooler can produce a temperature difference of up to 70 degrees Celsius between the hot and cold sides. So the cold side will operate at a lower temperature than ambient. This will create condensation, which obviously doesn't mix very well with electronics. Second, efficiency. Peltier cooling consumes disproportionately high amounts of electrical energy for dissipating heat. Third, cooling. To maximize the benefit of the Peltier, you need to cool the hot side sufficiently. High performance Peltier units, like the one included with EK's Delta Tech, are rated up to 200 watt. The Intel cryo cooling technology has a couple of unique features that makes it stand out in the market as a tech cooler that you could actually use in a daily system. First, there's a software solution to control the Peltier temperature. In cryo mode, the tech cooling is only switched on when required. This reduces the overall power consumed as the tech is not always running at maximum capacity. Second, the controller also measures the humidity in the room. Based on this input, the controller can then adjust the tech temperature to always be above the dew point. This helps avoid any condensation issues. Thirdly, it maximizes the impact of the Intel Thermal Velocity Boost feature by ensuring best case operating temperatures. Note that the Peltier will definitely dump additional heat into your water loop. So make sure you have the appropriate radiator size to cool the Peltier as well as your CPU and maybe some of the GPUs. Also make sure that your motherboard and chassis are compatible with the Peltier and with the radiators that you pick. There may be some incompatibility issues, just like Der Bauer showed in one of his videos. I added an extra radiator in my water loop just in case the added heat from the tech cooler would saturate the cooling solution if I were just using one radiator. I kind of ran into that issue, I think, in Scatterbencher number 36. Also, in Scatterbencher number 49 with the 13900K, I already saw quite high water temperature, so I figured better be safe than sorry. We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. Since we're focusing on P-Core overclocking, I will also disable all the E-Cores in the BIOS. Before starting overclocking, we have to, of course, check the system performance at default settings. And to do so, we must disable the E-Cores as well as configure Turbo Boost 2.0 correctly. Please note that out of the box, the Maximus Z790 Apex motherboard fully unleashes the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits. So in order to check the performance at default settings, we first have to go into the BIOS and go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Disabled Enforce All Limits. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. Set Active Efficiency Course to Zero then save and exit the BIOS. Ensure the cryo cooling mode is set to cryo in the operating system. Here is the benchmark performance at stock. Here are the 3 dmark CPU profile scores at stock. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU peak core clock is 5,321 MHz with 1.127 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 38 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 221.2 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P-Core clock is 5,500 MHz with 1.19 volts. The average CPU temperature is 93 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 36.8 degrees Celsius, and the average CPU package power is 203.8 watts. Now let us try our first overclocking strategy. However, before we get going, make sure to locate the CMOS clear button. Pressing the clear CMOS button will reset all your BIOS settings to default, which is helpful if you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. The clear CMOS button is located on the rear IO panel. In our first overclocking strategy, we take advantage of unleashing the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits and enabling Intel Extreme Memory Profile 3.0. Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 is a technology that allows the processor to run faster than base specification. It will do so when the processor is operating within current, power, and thermal limitations. The advantage is, of course, additional performance in both single-threaded and multi-threaded workloads. 
the Turbo Boost algorithm works according a proprietary EWMA formula, which stands for exponentially weighed moving average. The CPU reduces the CPU frequency if the average power consumed is higher than PL1. Adjusting the power limits is, strictly speaking, not overclocking. And that's because we don't change any of the electrical or frequency or thermal limitations. Essentially, Intel provides the Turbo Boost parameters as guidelines to motherboard vendors and system integrators. The point of the parameters is that the motherboards and systems would support the base performance of the CPU. But of course, better motherboards and better cooling and better systems in general will be able to have the processor run at peak performance for longer. Intel Extreme Memory Profile, or XMP, is an Intel technology that lets you automatically overclock your system memory, with the point being having more performance. It's built on the standard JDAC specification and essentially allows memory vendors just like G-Skill to program higher performance timings and frequency onto the memory sticks. Intel Extreme Memory Profile 3.0 is the new XMP standard for DDR5 memory. It is primarily based on the XMP 2.0 standard for DDR4, but has additional functionality. There's a lot more to the XMP 3.0 standard that is outside of the scope of this video. If you want to learn more about XMP 3.0, I suggest you can watch my Alder Lake launch video. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. Set Active Efficiency Cores to 0. Then save and exit the BIOS. Ensure the Cryo Cooling Mode is set to Cryo in the operating system. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. As expected, since we're not increasing the frequency of the CPU cores, the performance improvement is limited to the power-hungry benchmarks. Additionally, improving the memory performance by using XMP 3.0 does help in memory-sensitive benchmark applications. We see a highest performance improvement of plus 13.33% in Cinebench R23. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5,291 MHz with 1.1 to 1 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 37.2 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 222.5 watts. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5,499 MHz with 1.192 volts. The average CPU temperature is 98 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 36.6 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 213.4 watts. In our second overclocking strategy, we leverage the ASUS features AI overclocking and XMP tweaked. ASUS AI overclocking uses a unique strategy for automatic overclocking. Instead of working with preset frequency and voltage profiles, the system will monitor the CPU and cooling system throughout an initial testing phase. Based on its findings, it will then predict the optimal settings. There are three steps to enabling AI overclocking. First, reset the BIOS to default settings, then reboot and enter the operating system. Run a couple of heavy workloads such as Cinebench R23, Realbench or Intel XTU for 10 to 30 minutes. Then return to the BIOS and enter the AI OC guide menu from the top. Make sure to read through the explanation and click enable AI when ready. In addition to automatic overclocking, AI overclocking provides a lot of advanced information and suggestions in the AI features menu. The information includes the following. The SP value is based on the combination of maximum boost frequency, temperature, and P0 VID. A higher SP value would indicate a better quality core with superior overclocking capabilities, though it's not an exact science. There are a couple of options that allow you to fine-tune your AI overclock, including two that we'll use in this guide. Optimized AVX frequency allows you to toggle between normal use and heavy use, where heavy use should be selected if you're running extreme workloads like Prime95 with AVX enabled. 
the optimism scale can offset the overclocking predictions. If you set a value higher than 100, you tell the algorithm the cooler is better than estimated. So the frequencies will be higher. After enabling AI overclock and adjusting the optimized AVX frequency and optimism scale, the following settings have changed. I briefly covered this feature in my Alder Lake launch video, as well as Scatterbencher number 25 with, I believe, the 11900K processor. This feature allows you to configure a maximum temperature for the CPU. The ASUS motherboard will track the CPU temperature during operation. Once the temperature exceeds your target temperature, the CPU frequency will be reduced. It does this not directly by adjusting the CPU ratio, but by adjusting the Turbo Boost power limit parameters. When you enable AI overclocking, this feature is automatically enabled and set to 90 degrees Celsius. XMP Tweaked is a new option available in the ASUS BIOS alongside XMP1 and XMP2 that we are very familiar with already. All these three options leverage the memory kit XMP profile, but do so slightly different. XMP1 loads only the primary timings, frequency, and voltage. The secondary timings are adjusted by the motherboard auto rules. XMP2 loads the complete XMP profile, including the primary and secondary timings, the memory frequency, and the voltage. XMP tweaked is based on the XMP1 approach, but makes more aggressive adjustments to various subtimings. In this OC strategy, I try XMP tweaked instead of the XMP2 I usually use. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the AI OC guide. Go through the guide, then press enable AI when ready. Go to the extreme tweaker menu. Set AI overclock tuner to XMP tweaked. Set ASUS multi-core enhancement to enabled remove all limits. Set optimized AVX frequency to heavy AVX. Enter the AI features submenu. Set optimism scale to 95. Go to the advanced menu. Enter the CPU configuration submenu. Set active efficiency cores to zero. Then save and exit the BIOS. Ensure the cryo cooling mode is set to cryo in the operating system. We reran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. With AI overclocking, we increase the processor frequency from 5.8 GHz stock to 6 GHz and higher. Therefore, we expect a performance uplift, which we also see in the benchmark results. The performance uplift from AI overclocking is surprisingly good. We have the best performance improvement of plus 15.59% in Cinebench R23. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, unfortunately, the CPU is not stable. That's not surprising since AI overclock is designed for typical workload scenarios and not extreme workloads like Prime95 with AVX2 enabled. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU peak core clock is 5600 MHz with 1.148 volts. The average CPU temperature is 84 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 33.8 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 191 watts. In the third overclocking strategy, we will pursue a manual overclock. The manual overclock is based on configuring the turbo ratios and adaptive voltage mode. I can be pretty short about the turbo ratio configuration in this OC strategy because we keep it fairly simple. I set the bi-core usage configuration such that the peak cores can boost to 6.2 GHz when up to 4 cores are active, boost to 6 GHz when up to 6 cores are active, and boost to 5.9 GHz when all cores are active. In previous Raptor Lake Scatterbencher guides, I've discussed at length how Intel Adaptive Voltage works. While I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details in this video, I still want to give you a quick refresher as I think it's a good basis to explain my voltage configuration. On Raptor Lake, the VCCIA voltage rail drives the voltage for the CPU cores, P core and E cores, and the ring. That means a single voltage is used for all these parts of the CPU. How that voltage is configured is straightforward yet complex. There are three key aspects to understanding how voltage is configured on Intel platforms the CPU, the motherboard design, and the voltage regulator. Let's start with the CPU side of the story. 
An Intel CPU relies on a lot of voltage frequency curves or VF curves to manage its dynamic performance profile. A lot of parts inside your CPU have a VF curve, including those that are relevant for the VCCIA voltage rail. In this case, since we're disabling the E-cores, there are nine VF curves affecting the voltage rail, each of the eight P-cores and the ring. Based on these VF curves, to get a specific voltage provided via the VCCIA voltage rail, the CPU issues an SVID request to the voltage controller. The VID requested is the highest among all the requested voltages according to every VF curve affecting the voltage rail. The goal of the isVid voltage request from the CPU to the voltage regulator is that the effective voltage at the CPU die is equal to the requested voltage. However, as overclockers and enthusiasts know very well, that's not always the case. To avoid the voltage at the CPU die being much lower than what we request through the voltage frequency curve, we essentially have two tools, the AC-DC load line and the VRM load line. The AC-DC load line is a tool for motherboard engineers to bring into the voltage frequency curve equation also the electrical impedance of the motherboard. Electrical impedance is the opposition to alternating current and is affected by the VRM design, the PCB quality, the motherboard layout, and so on. Electrical impedance can significantly affect the effective voltage at the CPU die. Therefore, there may be a significant difference between the requested and effective voltage. We can define the AC-DC load line parameters to account for this difference. Adjusting the AC load line offsets the requested voltage, defined by the factory fused voltage frequency curve, to account for any electrical impedance. Adjusting the DC load line informs the CPU power control unit about the expected effective voltage at the CPU die. On the Maximus Z790 Apex, the DC load line is synced with the VRM load line, so there's no need to manually adjust this value. Before we look at how to set up AC-DC load line, we first have to talk about the VRM load line. The VRM load line is important for two reasons, the V-droop and undershoot. V-droop is the decrease in voltage when the CPU goes from idle to load. You want your CPU to be stable in all scenarios, so knowing the lowest voltage the CPU runs at is very important. Undershoot and its counterpart overshoot is a brief voltage spike that occurs when the CPU switches from idle to load or from load to idle. These spikes cannot be measured easily and usually require an expensive oscilloscope to detect. I highly recommend the Elmo Labs article titled VRM Load Line Visualized to see a great picture of undershoot and overshoot in action. While undershoot and overshoot are temporary spikes, an undershoot that's too low can cause instability. Advanced Voltage Offset is an extension of the Intel Adaptive Voltage Mode as it provides the end user with access to the voltage frequency curve and also allows the end user to change specific points on that VF curve. When we set an adaptive voltage in the BIOS, it is mapped against the OC ratio. Unless explicitly programmed, the OC ratio is the highest ratio configured for the CPU across all settings, including bi-core usage, per-core ratio limit, and OC TVB. In this OC strategy, that would be 62x. The voltage for ratios lower than the OC ratio is set either by its factory-fused VF point or, if there is no VF point, interpolated between the next and previous VF point. The primary purpose of advanced voltage offset is to allow end users to undervolt specific parts of the CPU voltage frequency curve. But in addition to undervolting, you can also use it for overvolting. Overclockers and enthusiasts use the advanced voltage offset most commonly in two ways. First, you configure a positive voltage offset for the highest VF point, which helps achieve a higher single threaded boost frequency. Second, you configure a negative voltage offset for the second highest VF point. That helps achieve a lower voltage for all core boost, which results in a lower temperature in all core boost and thus potentially additional overclocking headroom. On Raptor Lake, there are 15 distinct voltage frequency points. However, only points one to 11 are used. Furthermore, some points can be copies of other points. 
On the 13900K, the VF points are as follows. Unfortunately, it looks like the implementation of the VF points is not that mature yet, and a couple of issues can make it difficult to use it for daily systems. Two issues in particular are annoying. Sometimes the VF points don't work correctly in combination with 100 MHz BCLK. An easy workaround is to have the BCLK frequency slightly lower or higher than 100 MHz. Sometimes programming VF.9 conflicts with VF.10. The easy workaround is to program both VF points to the same value. Also, sometimes motherboards have auto rules that automatically set the adaptive voltage if end users set high CPU ratios. It's important to know that the VF.11 adds on top of that adaptive voltage. So if you're not careful and don't pay attention to the adaptive voltage, you may set a really high voltage. The easy workaround, of course, is to not leave the adaptive voltage set to auto when you're using the VF point configuration. I felt it was necessary to detail all of these steps or all of these parts of the Intel adaptive voltage mode to give more context to my voltage configuration. Some may call this configuration or the one that I'm using in this guide a purist approach because I wanted the actual voltage at the CPU die to match very closely the configured voltage frequency curve. Hence, I opted for an AC load line of 0.01 .01 and a VRM load line of level 8. Side note, generally, I do not recommend using VRM load line level 8. As for the VF points, I could substantially undervolt VF points 6 to 9 to achieve lower voltage in all core workloads and thus saw a nice boost in all core load frequency. In Prime 95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average P-Core frequency increased from 5,500 MHz to 5,752 MHz. For the maximum boost frequency of 6.2 GHz, I set an adaptive voltage of 1.425 V. As a result, the final voltage frequency curve for this OC strategy looks as follows. In addition to the turbo ratio and voltage configuration, we also make a couple of minor adjustments to our BIOS settings for this overclock. We set the BCLK frequency to 100.1 MHz to work around a potential issue with the configuration of the VF points. We set an AVX negative ratio offset of 4, reducing the CPU frequency in some AVX workloads. Since Alder Lake, there have been a couple of changes in the behavior. I discussed that in previous Raptor Lake guides. The long story short is that the AVX offset doesn't apply to all AVX workloads, for example, Cinebench R23. Thermal velocity boost is an Intel technology that exploits the fact that CPUs need less of voltage to run a specific frequency when the operating temperature is lower. As we want manual control over the operating voltage to ensure stability, it's prudent to disable this function. In addition to CPU overclocking, I also wanted to push the memory further. While I didn't quite hit my target of DDR5-8000, I was able to further increase the memory frequency to DDR5-7600 with the kit's XMP timings and slightly elevated voltage of 1.45V. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. Set Active Efficiency Cores to 0. Go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set a BCLK frequency to 100.15. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set DRAM frequency to 7650 MHz. Set Performance Core Ratio to By Core Usage. Set a 1 Core to 4 Core Ratio Limit to 62. Set a 5 Core and 6 Core Ratio Limit to 60. Set 7 core and 8 core ratio limit to 59. Enter the AVX related controls submenu. Set AVX2 ratio offset to per core ratio limit to user specify. Set AVX2 ratio offset to 4. Leave the AVX related controls submenu. Enter the DigiPlus VRM submenu. Set CPU load line calibration to level 8. Leave the DigiPlus VRM submenu. Enter the Internal CPU Power Management submenu. 
Set a regulate frequency by above threshold to disabled. Set IAAC load line to 0.01. Leave the internal CPU power management submenu. Enter the thermal velocity boost submenu. Set TVB voltage optimizations to disabled. Leave the thermal velocity boost submenu. Enter the VF point offset submenu. Set offset mode sine 6 to 10 to minus. Set VF point 6 to 100 millivolt. Set VF point 7 to 135 millivolt. Set VF point 8, 9 and 10 to 150 millivolt. Leave the VF point offset submenu. Set global core SVID voltage to adaptive mode. Set offset mode sign to plus. Set additional turbo mode CPU core voltage to 1.425. Set DRAM voltage mode to enabled. Set DRAM VDD voltage to 1.45. Set DRAM VDD Q voltage to 1.45. Then save and exit the BIOS. Ensure the cryo cooling mode is set to cryo in the operating system. We re-ran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. We increased the P-Core frequency by a modest 200 MHz for single-threaded workloads and 300 MHz in all-core workloads. That provides us with an also modest performance improvement across the board and an impressive plus 20% in Cinebench R23 Multi. Unfortunately, the C is Go performance dropped about 2% after switching to a manual BCLK frequency. While I could isolate the performance issue to the BCLK frequency, I could not quite figure out how to solve this one. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5162 MHz with 1.143 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 35.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 228.6 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5,752 MHz with 1.193 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 32.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 224.6 watts. In our fourth overclocking strategy, we move on to advanced tuning and try to leverage OCTVB to squeeze more frequency and more performance out of our system. We have two objectives. One, we want to use OCTVB to squeeze more frequency out of the chip and provide higher performance in light workloads. Two, we want to use cache dynamic OC switcher to improve the CPU frequency in heavy all-core workloads. In 2018, Intel introduced Thermal Velocity Boost on its Coffee Lake Core i9-8950HK mobile processor, and ever since, it's been an indispensable feature on Intel Core processors. Thermal Velocity Boost does two things. First, it decreases the operating voltage if the CPU temperature is below the TJ max. Two, it opportunistically increases the clock frequency above the Turbo Boost 2.0 and 3.0 frequencies based on how much the processor operates below its maximum temperature. With the introduction of the Intel cryo cooling technology in 2020, Intel opened up the TVB configuration to motherboard vendors. The feature is named Overclocking Thermal Velocity Boost or OCTVB for short. The easiest way to think about OCTVB is to limit or clip the turbo ratios based on the current CPU temperature. Essentially, the hotter your CPU, the more you clip the turbo ratio. OCTVB is based on the bi-core usage turbo ratio configuration. For each number of active cores, you can define two temperature points, each with a unique number of down bins. A down bin is essentially the number of ratios you want to drop. Let's take the configuration of this OC strategy. When one P-Core is active, the base ratio is 64X, so the frequency will be 6.4 GHz. However, when the temperature is 65 degrees Celsius, the ratio is clipped by 1X. That means the maximum ratio is now 63X. When all eight P-Cores are active, the base ratio is 62X, so the frequency will be 6.2 GHz. However, when the temperature is 65 degrees Celsius, the ratio is clipped by 2x. That means the maximum ratio is now 60x. When the temperature hits 90 degrees Celsius, 
the ratio is clipped once more by 1x. So the resulting maximum ratio is now 59x. Note that we have TJ Maxx configured at the default of 100 degrees Celsius. So beyond 100 degrees Celsius, the CPU will automatically reduce the frequency to stay within the thermal limit. Testing or validating an OCTVB configuration is notoriously tricky. And that's because you can't just simply run your extreme workload or stress test to check if it's stable. So most of OCTVB validation is essentially running through your benchmark suite and checking if everything is stable. Still, as I've demonstrated in previous Scatterventure guides, we can leverage the Thermal Velocity Boost Voltage Optimizations feature to get a rough idea of how many extra bins we can get with lower temperatures. ASUS Dynamic OC Switcher is a notable feature on ASUS AMD motherboards. It was first introduced on the Crosshair 8 Dark Hero motherboard, and I first showed it in Scatterbencher number 15. On AMD platforms, Dynamic OC Switcher allows at runtime switching between OC and PBO modes to maximize the overclocking for single core and all core workloads. Cache Dynamic OC Switcher is similar in that it enables at runtime switching at a specific trigger point. However, as the name already implies, Cache Dynamic OC Switcher isn't about optimizing the CPU frequency, it's about optimizing the ring frequency. Here's how it works. You define two so-called gears, high and low gear, and a trigger switching point. The trigger is the CPU current. Anything above the set threshold triggers low gear, and everything below the threshold activates high gear. Practically, low gear represents an all-core load, while high gear represents a light or few threaded workload. In high gear, you can define three parameters, the ring ratio, the ring voltage, and the number of threads to go to sleep. In low gear, you define two parameters, the ring ratio and the ring voltage. The motherboard will force several CPU threads to sleep when the high gear is activated. The threads are disabled in priority with the hyper threads first, then the E cores and then the P cores. Suppose you're using a Core i9-13900K and want only real P cores to be used in high gear mode. In that case, you'd set the number of threads to sleep to 24, as this will include the A P core hyper threads and the 16 E cores. The main reason why this feature exists is because the ring can operate at a higher frequency when only P cores are active in comparison to when both P cores and E cores are active. However, in this guide, we use it for a different reason. Attentive viewers will have noticed something strange with the Prime 95 results of OC Strategy 1 and 3. While the frequency increased in the non-AVX workload from 5.5 GHz to 5.75 GHz, the frequency in the AVX enabled workload actually decreased from 5,291 MHz to 5,162 MHz. What happened? Long story short, VF curves happened. As I explained before, the VCCIA voltage rail drives the voltage for the CPU P cores, E cores and ring, and the voltage requested by the CPU to the voltage controller is the highest among all associated VF curves. The ring frequency drops to 4.5 GHz in an all-core workload on this system. When we look at the ring VF curve, we see that the voltage associated with 45X is 1.14 volt. When we look at the default P-core VF curve, we see that the voltage for 51X and 52X are 1.15 and 1.17 volt. So in an all-core workload with a CPU frequency of 5.2 GHz and a ring frequency of 4.5 GHz, the VCCIA voltage is determined by the P cores, so 1.17 volt. However, after the undervolting from OC strategy number three, we find that the voltage for 51X and 52X are now 1.05 and 1.06 volt. So in the same situation, the VCCIA voltage is now determined by the ring, 1.14 volt. So effectively, the voltage provided to the P cores is higher than needed for that frequency. So pushes the CPU temperature over TJ Maxx. As a response, the CPU will reduce the P-core frequency to stay below TJ Maxx. 
Ordinarily, the only option here would be to prevent the ring from boosting beyond 43x or 44x in the BIOS, and that's totally possible with the BIOS options that are available. However, with Cache DOS, we can have the best of both worlds. 5 GHz ring in most workloads and lower or less than 4.5 GHz in the extreme workloads. As you'll see in the Prime95 results, that helps improve the AVX enabled P core frequency from 5162 MHz to 5434 MHz. By the way, as a side note, there are actually VF points for the ring, they're just not exposed in any of the biases available. If we would have access to the VF points of the ring, we could possibly undervolt the ring to also work around this problem. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the advanced menu. Enter the CPU configuration submenu. Set active efficiency cores to zero. Go to the extreme tweaker menu. Set AI overclock tuner to XMP2. Set BCLK frequency to 100.15. Set ASUS multi-core enhancement to enabled remove all limits. Set DRAM frequency to DDR5 7615 MHz. Set performance core ratio to by core usage. Set one core to three core ratio limit to 64. Set four core ratio limit to 63. Set five core to eight core ratio limit to 62. Enter the specific performance core submenu. Set performance core 2 and core 6 specific ratio limit to 63. Set performance core 2 and core 6 specific voltage to adaptive mode. Set offset mode sign to plus. Set additional turbo mode CPU core 2 and core 6 voltage to 1.5. Leave the specific performance core submenu. Enter the AVX related controls submenu. Set AVX2 ratio offset to per core ratio limit to user specify. Set AVX2 ratio offset to 6. Leave the AVX related controls submenu. Enter the DigiPlus VRM submenu. Set CPU load line calibration to level 8. Leave the DigiPlus VRM submenu. Enter the internal CPU power management submenu. Set a regulate frequency by above threshold to disabled. Set IAAC load line to 0.01. Leave the internal CPU power management submenu. Enter the Thermal Velocity Boost submenu. Set Cache Dynamic OC Switcher to Enabled. Set Current Threshold to Switch to Low Cache Gear to 160. Set Threads to Sleep for High Cache Gear to 0. Set High Cache Ratio to 50. Set Low Cache Ratio to 44. Set TVB Voltage Optimizations to Disabled. Set Overclocking TVB to Enabled. Set a 1 core to 6 core active to enabled. For each core active, set temperature A to 65. For each core active, set negative ratio offset A to user specify. For 1 core to 6 core active, set ratio offset A to 1. For 7 core and 8 core active, set ratio offset A to 2. For 1 core to 4 core active, set temperature B to 80. For 5 core and 6 core active, set temperature B to 85. For 7 core and 8 core active, set temperature B to 90. For the other core active, set temperature B to 90. For each core active, set negative ratio offset B to user specify. For each core active, set ratio offset B to 1. Leave the thermal velocity boost submenu. Enter the VF point offset submenu. Set offset mode sign 6 to 10 to minus. Set VF point 6 to 100 millivolt. Set VF point 7 to 135 millivolt. Set VF point 8, 9 and 10 to 150 millivolt. Leave the VF point offset submenu. Set global core ISVID voltage to adaptive mode. Set offset mode sign to plus. Set additional turbo mode CPU core voltage to 1.5. Set high DRAM voltage mode to enabled. Set DRAM VDD voltage to 1.45. Set DRAM VDDQ voltage to 1.45. Then save and exit the BIOS. Ensure the cryo cooling mode is set to cryo in the operating system. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. While this OC strategy allows us to squeeze more frequency out of our CPU, it won't improve the performance in all scenarios. 
That's because the OCTVB leverages lower temperatures primarily. In fact, the performance improvements should only appear in light workloads such as the 3DMark CPU profile benchmark, which doesn't push the CPU to the TJ Max. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 19.67% in Geekbench 5 Multi. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU peak core clock is 5434 MHz with 1.129 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 33 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 230.5 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU peak core clock is 5738 MHz with 1.193 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 33.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 222.2 watts. Of course, a scatterbencher guide using Intel cryocooling technology and the EK Delta tech wouldn't be complete unless we also tried unregulated mode. Essentially, we'll use unregulated mode to squeeze more frequency out of our chip and maybe also have a little bit of extra performance in the lighter workloads. Next to cryo, unregulated is one of the two modes available in the Intel cryocooling technology. In cryo mode, the Intel software ensures that the tech temperature never drops below the dew point to avoid condensation. In unregulated mode, however, the tech always runs at full power. Thus, the temperature will drop well below ambient. You may face water droplets on your hardware without proper insulation, so be careful. The tech controller will flash a purple light if it's an unregulated mode. Also, the tray icon of the cryocooling software will turn white. From an overclocker's perspective, unregulated mode is useful in two ways. First, it enables near or below zero temperatures in idle. That typically allows for a higher frequency, although this is more for show-off than for practical use. Second, it enables below ambient temperatures in light workloads. This typically makes the same overclock in unregulated mode more stable than cryo mode and can even slightly boost performance. Unregulated mode does not improve the overclocking experience in workloads where cryo mode is already pushing the Peltier to run at full power. In this OC strategy, we use unregulated mode to push the P-cores to boost to 6.5 GHz for up to two active P-cores. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the advanced menu. Enter the CPU configuration submenu. Go to the extreme tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set BCLK Frequency to 100.15. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5 7650 MHz. Set Performance Core Ratio to By Core Usage. Set 1 Core and 2 Core Ratio Limit to 65. Set 3 Core and 4 Core Ratio Limit to 64. Set 5-core to 8-core ratio limit to 62. Enter the specific performance core submenu. Set performance core 0, core 1, core 3, core 4, core 5, and core 7 specific ratio limit to 65. Set performance core 2 and core 6 specific ratio limit to 64. Set performance core 2 and core 6 specific voltage to adaptive mode. Set offset mode sign to plus. Set additional turbo mode CPU core 2 and core 6 voltage to 1.5. Leave the specific performance core submenu. Enter the AVX related controls submenu. Set AVX2 ratio offset to per core ratio limit to user specify. Set AVX2 ratio offset to 6. Leave the AVX related controls submenu. Enter the Digi Plus VRM submenu. Set CPU load line calibration to level 8. Leave the Digi Plus VRM submenu. Enter the internal CPU power management submenu. Set a regulate frequency by above threshold to disabled. Set IAAC load line to 0.01. Leave the internal CPU power management submenu. Enter the thermal velocity boost submenu. Set cache dynamic OC switcher to enabled. Set current threshold to switch to low cache gear to 160. Set threads to sleep for high cache gear to zero. 
set high cash ratio to 50, set a low cash ratio to 44, set TVB voltage optimizations to disabled, set overclocking TVB to enabled, set a one core to eight core active to enabled. For one core and two core active, set temperature A to 35. For three core to eight core active, set temperature A to 65. For each core active, set negative ratio offset A to user specify. For one core, two core, seven core and eight core active, set a ratio offset A to two. For three core to six core active, set ratio offset A to one. For one core to four core active, set temperature B to 80. For five core and six core active, set temperature B to 85. For seven core and eight core active, set temperature B to 90. For each core active, set negative ratio offset B to user specify. For each core active, set ratio offset B to one. Leave the thermal velocity boost submenu. Enter the VF point offset submenu. Set offset mode sign six to 10 to minus. Set VF point six to 100 millivolt. Set VF point seven to 125 millivolt. Set VF point eight to 135 millivolt. Set VF point nine and 10 to 150 millivolt. Leave the VF point offset submenu. Set global core ISVID voltage to adaptive mode. Set offset mode sign to plus. Set additional turbo mode CPU core voltage to 1.5. Set high DRAM voltage mode to enabled. Set DRAM VDD voltage to 1.45. Set DRAM VDDQ voltage to 1.45. Then save and exit the BIOS. Ensure the cryo cooling mode is set to unregulated in the operating system. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. The performance improvement of unregulated mode is primarily visible in the single-threaded benchmarks like SuperPi, Geekbench 5, and CPU-Z. That's because those benchmarks would not engage the full cooling potential of the tech in cryo mode. We also see modest improvements across the board in the CPU profile benchmark because it's a relatively light workload. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 21.63% in Geekbench 5 single. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPP core clock is 5418 MHz with 1.13 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 32.6 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 230.4 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5,693 MHz with 1.2 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is 32.9 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 224.3 watts. All right, let's wrap this up. Overclocking with the EK Delta tech and Intel cryo cooling technology is always an adventure. It makes us dream of frequencies that are unattainable with regular water cooling. On the 10900K, we got it up to 6 GHz. On the 11900K, we got 5.6 GHz. And with this 13900K, we got it all the way up to 6.5 GHz. I would have never imagined seeing 6.5 GHz on what is essentially still water cooling before the Raptor Lake processors launched. Also, it seems like this EK Delta 2 tech is pretty good with the 13900K when all P cores and all E cores are enabled. Essentially, it allows for up to 260 watt sustained CPU package power. That's pretty good for Peltier cooling. I was also pretty happy that we were able to leverage Asus's new feature, Cache Dynamic OC Switcher. I know the performance gains aren't really that impressive, but for people who enjoy the puzzle aspect of overclocking like me, it's always neat to find a new way to extract a little bit more performance. Anyway, that's it for this video. I wanna thank you for watching and the patrons for the support. As per usual, I will put up a written version of this video up on my blog. So if you wanna read through the BIOS settings or check the performance results, you can do it over there. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and see you next time.